After a thousand hours of learning game dev, I've learned an important analogy. Game dev is like learning how to make a toast. You just want to press the button, so the toast gets toasted. But there is no bread, no button or toaster. So you start by learning about electricity, circuits and wiring. How to make a cable and a case. Then you learn how to make a bread, learn different recipes and make your first bread. You are happy and you put the bread in. You push the button down, you hear a little click sound, but nothing happens. So you press again and again and again and suddenly the toast explodes. After hours of research, you read a post from 10 years ago and you learn that you needed to rotate the bread 180 degrees around the y-axis before putting it in. Does it make sense? No. Do I have to do it anyway? Of course. Now you know what caused the problem, but you have to start all over again so you have a suitable framework to toast your bread. Since I had no prior knowledge about game dev, besides a Flappy Bird clone made in C++ where you could unlock characters and choose a difficulty, I started basically at zero. The first project was just learning how to move the character, set up the camera and use basic animations. I've encountered many mistakes and things where I didn't even know what the problem was. Sometimes you just make something, start the game and just think what the fuck is happening right now. Or you think you can fix something and it just becomes worse. For the game it was important for me that it included wall jumps to make the movement more free and fun as well as a side dodge with invincibility frames. But since I only found tutorials that included wall slides and then a jump, I had to figure out a way to program a wall jump so the character bounces off the wall like a rubber ball. So for now I came up with this. When I press the jump key, I shoot a ray cast forward. If that ray cast hits an object which the character can use for a wall jump, two other rays are shot. One 15 degrees to the right and the other one 15 degrees to the left. Whichever ray hits the wall first determines if the wall is on the right side or the left side. After that, the angle at which I'm facing the wall is calculated and put into the equation to calculate the bounce angle. In addition, the character walks up the wall a bit so he can cover more vertical distance. It's pretty basic, but I will replace the ray cast with a sphere cast in the near future so I can get a more reliable calculation of the angles. The side dodge acts as an animation cancelling method so you are never stuck in an attack, movement or whatever you are doing. The gameplay should be as smooth as possible and not feel clunky at all. While I talk about the genres, I will show you the progress we've made with the game. But since this video should focus mainly on the knowledge I've gained and the misconceptions I could clear up, I won't say much about the progress since it's mostly visible and clear by itself. Initially, I thought the genre primarily determined the feeling the game would create. However, I realized the genre also greatly impacts the amount of time you have and how resource efficient you want your game to be, which is obviously the most important factor for an indie game developer. For example, a linear progression RPG is one of the most resource inefficient genres. The reusability of assets is limited because enemies need to become stronger as the game progresses. Therefore, you must create numerous different enemies and variations of them. Additionally, the world needs to evolve alongside the player's progression too, so objects like stones, trees and even colors shouldn't remain the same throughout the whole game. So simply reusing the same assets throughout the game wouldn't align with the RPG genre. You also need at least some story and if you have these elements together, you can create a feeling for the world, but it takes much time to create this atmosphere and it's definitely not an easy task. On the other hand, in a roguelike, you can work very resource efficiently. Assets tend to repeat themselves constantly and the levels are often very straightforward. Players don't spend much time looking at walls, forests, the sky or whatever details you have in your world. So the reusability of assets during the player's gameplay is high, allowing developers to focus their efforts on other aspects of the game like the combat system. And this is often the focus in roguelikes and takes most of the work, since without a combat system a roguelike wouldn't be fun, as the other aspects are secondary. This is our first game and we are still early on in the knowledge gathering phase, which is why we decided to change our game from an RPG to a roguelike. Besides that, we don't have years to make a game, which an RPG surely needs if it shouldn't have an extremely simplistic low poly graphic. And making a visually pleasing higher resolution graphic for a game is hard and requires so much extensive amount of work. I mean just consider the time for making a character game ready. 
If you model a character, you can just put it in the game. The geometry of the surface of the model is in a grid-like structure, the mesh. This consists of faces, edges and vertices. All models in a game consist of meshes and every frame the geometry gets calculated. Most of the processes regarding making video games faster are about how to reduce the geometry rendered efficiently while maintaining the graphical quality. There are five popular methods for this. The first one is making different levels of detail, LODs, for an object. If you are far away, the quality of the object is low, which is barely visible for the player, since the object is far enough away. So if you get closer, the object changes at certain distances to a higher resolution mesh. Objects often have multiple LODs and faraway trees have a billboard LOD. Other methods include culling. The culling techniques calculate which objects need to be rendered. Frustum culling calculates in a pyramid shape in front of the character what the player sees and it culls objects which are not in his field of view. So only objects in front of the player are rendered. Occlusion culling calculates which objects are fully hidden behind other objects and doesn't render them. The last one is backface culling. Faces which look away from the player won't get rendered. So these culling methods allow the engine to render mostly only the truly visible geometry and cull the not visible geometry. LODs and culling improve the performance drastically and without them modern games wouldn't be playable. The last method is the one I hate because all the culling methods are mostly automatic. You don't have to program them yourself because for example Unity has them built in. Maybe they are not the best and you could buy a tool for it, but it is anyway built in. But retopology is something which you have to learn if you want to do a 3D character. If we look at this scene, the current vertice amount rendered is 6 million. Now if you look at this character, it has 1.5 million vertices. It's obvious that this character has way too many vertices. If you have this character and three other enemies, they would consume as much resource as the whole visible scene. So we somehow have to reduce the geometry so the mesh is much simpler. Since AI programs only give usable results for super simple objects, you have to draw a new mesh by hand. You make a new face, another face, and so on, but you also have to look out for areas which have a more complex structure, for example curvy surfaces like noses, lips or heads. This process is so tedious and takes time and it gave me multiple mental breakdowns. Maybe some people enjoy it and say, oh it's so fulfilling to do it, but I hate it. It's so much pain and yeah, Jesus, I, I hate it so much, but you have to do it, otherwise you can't use the models in the game. So after that, you have a much simpler mesh and you can bake the details of the high resolution model onto the low resolution model. This model now is usable with about 75,000 vertices in comparison to the original model which has about 20 times more vertices. For most objects I would now have to make LODs, but since it's the character I play myself I don't need them, because it will always have the same distance to the camera. This is also why many indie game devs choose a simpler low poly graphic, since you don't have to do the retopology or LODs or whatever you need to do if you use a more high resolution graphic. So if you've done the retopology, you can rig the character, animate it and then put it in the game. If we now look back at choosing the genre, you can see why a graphically simple roguelike is one of the most efficient and time effective genres. One of the hardest things I had to figure out while I learned game dev is how to find the right work-life balance. Because if you are an indie game developer, the release of the game is completely dependent on how much you work on the game. For example, if you have 5000 hours of stuff to implement, you can do it in 2 years or 5 years. It completely depends on how much you work. Since I'm doing game dev to make a better life for my family, I pressured myself on finishing everything fast but without shortings in quality. So my working hours slowly increased from 55 hours in the first two months to about 65 to 70 hours in the two months after that, which is obviously not sustainable for a human. I worked 7 days a week, 9 to 11 hours a day, but I also have two kids and a wife, which also need my time and balancing that was really hard. I set myself a limit of 50 hours of work at most. If some weeks are 55 hours it's also alright, but it's important to find a sustainable work-life balance, otherwise you will get a burnout or you don't have a consistent progress, so you will get to a phase where you think, ah damn I didn't make the progress I made the last month or whatever you may think. 
so it's important that you have a consistent, sustainable work-life balance. When I worked 70 hours a week, or all I could think about was developing the game. I dreamed about it, I thought about it when going to sleep, when showering, when talking to my kids or while whatever I was doing. I was completely obsessed with it and all other parts of my life took a big hit. I also spent hours over-optimizing things and changing the color theme of the game 200 times in different nuances. So it was hard to stop getting caught up in those things, which for now have no part in reaching the goal. I should concentrate on prototyping the game so I know if the ideas I have even work together. But I guess those things are just part of learning game dev and learning a good work-life balance for being an entrepreneur. I know there are many things which I have to learn and I hope I can build a community which will be a part of that. Yeah, that was the video. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a nice day.